Hello. Ooh. Hello. 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 Hey. Hi. Hey. Hey. All right. Hello. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Talitha. Hi, Alex. Hi, SJ. Hey. How many hellos do you need for four people? <laughs> You need a lot. Four <laughs> times four? Your own personal living hell oh. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just Good kidding. Pun. Nice. Strong. Oh pun. man. Big pun. Okay. Big pun. Well So you're connected with Robert? Yeah, he's got I've got him as a contact. Um I don't know if he's yeah. online yet. Um says he's offline. But I can try to call him and see what happens. Talitha, where are you? Uh... I'm in a parking lot. <laughs> Camry, I was like, oh my god, two hours and I'm still not home from LA. The traffic is crazy. Uh, oh man. Is Robert What's here? Going? Yeah, it's me. Hey, Robert. What's going on? Not much. Hold on. Um, Glad to have you. I got, I got Skype yeah. going out all over the place. <laughs> Cacophony. Okay, it was on my phone, on my computer, but here we are. Um, just to let you know, we've got four people, uh, not including you. And okay. so we'll, we'll probably not do video, just to let you know, if you don't want to. Okay. If you don't have to, uh, just to keep the, the uh, network okay and everything. There we go. Um, Anonymous. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, this, I don't know. Everybody want to introduce themselves? Sure. Yeah. Hey, Robert, this is Dennis Cook. Hi, Dennis Cook. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice Thanks to meet for you coming. Too. Yeah, my pleasure. And, uh, um, <laughs> Robert, hi, I'm SJ Anderson. I'm fellow Austinite, and, um, yeah, nice to talk to you. I've been listening to some of your shows the last few days just to kind of get up to speed with you, a little bit of your work and stuff. So it's good to connect with you, and I'm sure we'll jump into a bunch of stuff here shortly. Yeah, cool. And yeah, where do you live here in Austin? I live in Cherrywood, right off of Manor Road, just east of the highway there. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And so where are you? I'm on the other side of town. I'm in Oak Hill. You're in Oak Hill? Okay. Yeah. Right. Nice. And we have one more. Hi, it's Talia. So good to be talking to all of you. It's been a while, and uh, I'm really excited for for uh, the group we have today. So thanks for having me. Hi, Talia. Hello. Thanks for joining as well. It's nice to talk to you as well. Um, and I, oh yeah, and I'm Alex Fulton, uh, and. Robert, we've spoken a little bit on Facebook before, and I've been following you for a while, and I've been talking with these guys about having you on for a while, so glad we're all here, and do you, are you familiar with Always Record at all? The only thing I, that I'm familiar with is seeing the the links on the on the kitchen sink page, right? Um, and you've had a lot of different people on there. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's pretty yeah. long, long running. It's just like it's a really casual kind of conversation. It's not really structured like a lot a lot of podcasts or anything. It's just kind of laid back and but we like to talk about a lot of weird stuff. Um, Good. So I don't know. I, I don't I don't really know how to start. Um, does anybody have any first opening thoughts or questions? Yeah, to? I I want to just throw out. I mean. I think a theme maybe, I mean, you're an astrologer and um, we've got the, I guess, the great American eclipse, as they're calling it, coming up here in August. And so maybe, I don't know, just to open, I think it might be good to just open with some like thoughts you might have about what that could signify and just a little bit of background. The um, I know that Robert Zoller, the astrologer, used the eclipse in June 1999 to, or um, sorry, 2001 to predict uh, 9 11. And so I'm not sure if, like, those techniques are something you're familiar with or just your own techniques or what these eclipses might mean to you or if you've even thought about this eclipse. But yeah, I've, I've thought about a... it. Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, I have a, 
think I have a chart on it, actually, if I'm not mistaken. Um, there's another aspect that I'm really interested in, and we could certainly talk about the eclipse. I, I, so there's this uh, Chiron, which is this planetoid between Saturn and Uranus, and um, it's, it's going to change signs uh, next year, and it's going to go into the sign of Aries, which is really interesting because the last time Chiron was in Aries was, it was in 1969. And if you know anything about 1969, it's one of the most um, wow. volatile years of the last century. And just with one month alone, when Chiron went into Aries in February of 1969, I have at least five events that will just blow your mind. Plus, we're looking at going, in, uh, going into Uranus and Taurus next year. And we've had Uranus and Aries for seven years, and, and it's going into Taurus uh, next year, and that's going to mark a big change for money and material goods and uh, production and automation and a bunch of other things. So we could also talk about that if you're into that. And clearly, I'll be happy to look at the the uh, the, 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 the 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 chart for the eclipse on September. Let me let me do this. Why don't you guys start and let me line up the eclipse chart so. Um, I can actually look at that, look at that, and I'll do an overlay of that with Trump's chart and maybe the United States chart too. So we'll have three things to play with. Okay, that's cool. great. And and one other thing, I mean, it might be good. We're kind of jumping right in here. Any thoughts you want to give us about just who you are? Maybe. I mean, I know you've got a website. Is it robertphoenix.com? Is that is that that's your? That's correct. It's robertphoenix.com and. I've been uh, doing that website or, or working on that website since 2008, and it was the run-up to the first Barack Obama election. And it was just kind of a, a website where I was working out some things, you know, just posting some random stuff and trying to get my feet wet in that world. And then Sarah Palin was announced as the – um, candidate, the vice presidential candidate for John McCain. And I'm like, well, well, who is this woman? Where did she come from? I didn't know anything about her, but I wanted to look at her chart. And I did, and I put it up on my website, and my hits went through the roof. I'm like, wow, that's this is something. Maybe I need to continue to kind of go down this, this path. And I did, and that's where it all kind of started. And I owe everything to Sarah Palin as far mm -hmm. as changing my life because at that time I was I was out of work and I'd, I had a background in astrology and esoterica. I'd worked at a magazine called Mondo 2000 back in the late 90s group in the Bay Area psychedelic cybernetics high strange it was all it was all in there and I just needed a kind of a vehicle to put it all together and um, that's that's when it happened and, and uh, so thank you Sarah Palin. <laughs> Without Sarah Palin, none of us would be here today. She changed many lives, apparently. Well, it's funny because Steve Bannon, Trump's buddy, um, made a movie about her, a documentary that was like about her. Uh, I haven't seen it, but about her meteoric rise and how she's like this uh, authentic kind of heartland part product of America. I don't know. It seems like some kind of right-wing kind of propaganda but at the same time i don't know that um so that's kind of funny because that's an, that's a steve bannon link right there and he is i'd like to see his chart i don't know if you've looked at steve bannon's chart at all i have looked at his chart i did a post on his chart and he's he's pretty high powered he is he's a sagittarius so he's you know said the theme about sagittarius is that they like to be honest. I mean, they're into sort of the truth and authenticity, and they 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 tend to not suffer fools gladly, um, and which is good. We like all those things. Of all the signs, Sagittarius also has the uh, kind of high, highest degree of moving towards fascism, <laughs> because because Sagittarius is really it, it can get like really strictly orthodox. And um, so Bannon has some of that in his chart, and he's pretty high powered. He has, he has a lot of Sagittarius and a lot of Leo in his chart. So he is uh, he's he's passionate about his ideals, and that's pretty much what you would expect out of a Sagittarius. 
So that's I, kind of his rough astrological rundown. I think it um, it would be useful maybe as we go along and we're talking about this to bring it in our own uh, things because I'm a Sagittarius rising, so that's very interesting to hear uh, that I can tend towards fascism. Um, but yeah, Robert, well, I learned Sagittarius is that they're convinced that they know the, that at some level they know the truth, and at some level they probably do. <laughs> You're, right, you but 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 the the disconnect is is that them knowing the truth and then going and and convincing millions of other people about the same truth is is two different things. Now the mm-hmm. other thing with Sagittarius, in, in as much as it can be very truthful, it can be incredibly cynical as well, mm-hmm. because if it understands the truth and sees a disconnect between what they view as the truth and how consensus reality. Is kind of operator operating or not operating in relation to that cynicism can set in, and now you look at a guy like Jim Morrison, who is a fantastically cynical Sagittarius. So that's the other side of, of Sag. When 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 the truth, like Mark Twain was a Sagittarius, and when Mark Twain uh, grew older, he became quite cynical. His wife died, and he he his whole kind of overt liter- with his literature and his and his point of view became quite dark and acerbic, even more so than when he was much younger. So that's the, that's the shadow of Sag, is cynicism. Totally. <laughs> Dennis, were you going to say something? <laughs> oh, I was just going to say that uh, um, uh, Robert recently did a reading of Jared Kushner, and I, I learned that I share his birthday. Um, uh, so as a Capricorn, uh, a January 10th birthday, uh, I was happy, and you know, some people are viewing him as the the antichrist. So nothing does the self confidence better than to know you share the birthday of the antichrist. So, <laughs> but, uh, uh, Robert, um, doesn't the Sibley USA chart have Sag rising? That's that? correct. It does have Sag rising. Mm-hmm. And is and, that do you, there's a fascistic? You, would you say that that was would be a kind of this, a bend toward fascism? That's a portent or somehow. I mean, would you yeah, make that so connection? Here, here's, here's how I, uh, how I see it. Sagittarius also deals with other countries and religion. And when there's that kind of outward sort of directed energy, that the fascism isn't necessarily kind of an, an inward um, relationship, but it's expressed in other places. So what we're doing in the Middle East or North Africa or what we did in Vietnam or any, any of these kind of post-World War II, maybe post-Korea involvements is in some ways kind of a projection of our internal fascism into other, other countries in the world. So in, it's, it's almost like we either take it here or we put it out there. And based on you know the desire to the, the desire to do business and keep the semblance of a middle class, so all these elites can you know continue to get their economic perks for now. Um, it tends to be out there. So I would say that yes, that fascism does relate to the U.S. chart, but it relates to other countries that we're engaged with, and not necessarily internally. Although that might change. Obviously, we we've got a lot going on here and. This thing could explode at any moment, and we'll see, you know, where it all goes. Talitha, were you going to say something? So, I, yeah, I was. I don't know if this is the right time to ask this, but we can come back to it if it's not. I had two questions. One was, you mentioned Chiron. What, what did you say again was happening with Chiron this next year? Was it Chiron you said is changing? Chiron goes into um, the Aries. sign of Aries. It's been in... It's been in uh, Pisces for quite a while, and Chiron tends to have generational influences. It's a, of all the kind of celestial objects out there, it has the most uneven orbits. Chiron and Pluto have uneven orbits, and Chiron, Chiron is, is considered yeah, the it, it's, 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 it, it's in it's in this um, sort of Kuiper Belt region between Saturn and Uranus, and there are they discovered these. Sort of, they look like asteroids. They're, they're large chunks of of matter in space, and they're all kind of floating between Saturn and Uranus. And every now and then, Saturn will suck one of these um, asteroids in and 
kind of claim it as a moon, but Chiron and another asteroid, which is actually named after Chiron's wife, are the two uh, asteroids that actually have these orbits, these elliptical orbits, and it was discovered in 1977. And there's a very interesting mythology <laughs> around Chiron. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, in, in and of itself, that is between Saturn, which represents law and order and discipline and structure and form and Satan and the black cube and all that stuff. And you have Uranus on the other side, which is, you know, it's abandoned, it's novelty, it's invention, it's, uh, you know, the left-handed path and breaking from the norm. So these are two sort of social and, and uh, psychological structures that, that, uh, that Chiron straddles between. And so those have ramifications for each of us because we all kind of operate between those two poles in our lives. And, and the other ramification is that it, it relates to shame because when Chiron, based on the myth of Chiron, when Chiron was born, his, his mother rejected him because she thought that she was going to get it. She was a nymph. Uh, I believe her name was, was Oceana, I think. And she was a nymph, a sea nymph. And Kronos came down and he decided that he was going to appear as a, as a horse. Of course, because that's the way he wanted to seduce a nymph. He became a horse. And um, so he mated with uh, Chiron's mom and she produced a centaur. And when she saw him, she was in shock. In fact, she was in, in such shock, she never wanted to ever have a child again and decided that she wanted to become a tree. And of course, they became a tree and Chiron was adopted uh, by... Um, Apollo, and uh, I believe it was Demeter, and between Apollo and Demeter, he was schooled in all these arts, prophecy, archery, poetry, medicine, and, and of all the centaurs who kind of have this mythological reputation as being like hillbillies, Chiron is the most, um, he's the most refined, and he winds up becoming the teacher of most of the heroes um, of the Odyssey, and, and he's a very, it's a very interesting aspect, and so when we deal with Chiron, Internally, we deal with issues that are connected to chirotic issues or shame, or repression, structure, kind of conditioning from the Saturnian side, breaking free. It's an important aspect in the chart. And culturally, we've been going through Chiron and, and Pisces, and we've been dealing with you know, the wound of Pisces and the wound of water and fracking. And, you know, if you believe, of, you know, whatever happened in Fukushima was real, then, of course, what's happening in the Pacific Ocean and what happened in the Gulf of Mexico. These are all very wounded water kind of some metaphors for Chiron and Pisces. But it also represents the wound of faith because Pisces represents religion and the age of Pisces and, and Jesus. And so there's this kind of wounding of people's faith. And some people who have Chiron and Pisces as clients, they've actually come back to their faith in kind of a unique way. And this is in, on a client side, I, I've talked to a number of clients with Chiron and Pisces who had major falling away from the church, uh, many of which who would had some kind of strange sexual experience, you know, with one of the church leaders. Again, another kind of Chiron and Pisces moment. And we're getting ready to, to move out of that now and go into Chiron and Aries, which is a very different energy in the United States chart, has natal Chiron and Aries down in its natal fourth house at 20 degrees. So, you know, what do we deal with? We deal with violence and guns and football and head injuries and trauma and all these other things that are associated with Chiron. So it's coming back around and it hasn't been in uh, Aries since 1969, which is kind of interesting. If you look at 1969 alone, um, there's some fascinating things that are going on politically, uh, fascinating things going on with like with terrorism, uh, the, you know, the first troop pullouts. The, the Vietnam War starts in 1969, and so we're on our way really towards healing our relationship with war. It's a fa it's an absolutely fascinating, turbulent year, and we're coming back to it now. And it's going to be interesting to see what happens, especially if they continue to run these kind of micro wars where they're you know upping the ante, 200, 300, 400, 500 troops at a time, uh, and. And so we're, we'll, we'll, I, it's going to be interesting to see how we react to that. Because that was really the height of the anti-war movement was 1969. You had yeah. SDS and you had the weathermen taking over the SDS convention in Chicago. It was big. You know, it, was, it was a really kind of big deal. So it's going to be fascinating to see what happens 
especially if they do this escalation. Now, the other thing, and I'll, I'll be quiet after this, is that what's happening on, on the uh, technological front is that there's a whole other war taking place. It's not just, you know, what we're doing, sneaking people into Mosul and other places in Yemen, but that's happening. But there's also this whole kind of tech thing now. There's a tech war going on, and that's a whole other wrinkle to this notion of what war looks like and what war feels like. So we're, we're, you know, this new, this next version of Chiron is going to be um, in, in uncharted territory. And also because we're, we have to talk about Uranus and Taurus, which I believe will be the beginning of automation, big time automation. So Chiron and Aries, Aries meaning the human, the man, the, you know, whatever pronoun you want to use, right? I mean, that's a wound. And so we're going to be dealing with our relationship as human humanity with Saturn, the old way of doing things, which has, you know, been fairly organic or industrial or whatever. And then Uranus on the other side, which is going to be all about tech and modification. And this is going to be another big piece during Chiron and Aries. It's like, what's going to be the nature of humanity? You know, how, how are we going to evolve? Are we going to evolve with, um, you know, some sort of additions or upgrades and, are there going to be revolts against that? It's going to be a very interesting seven-year spin starting next year. Yeah, I I heard I heard what one of the um, things that I was listening to that you were talking about at one point. You had talk you were talking about um, Russia, and I'm wondering if you have compared um, any of the charts between America and Russia based on on this, you know. Um, um, change with Chiron and some of the things that might come up in terms of a war and a different kind of war, one that may not be as blatantly surfaced as say a Vietnam uh, as the Vietnam War, but that's uh, actually a much more you know subsurface and and uh, sort of a breaking down of the morality of the United States. Um, mm -hmm. Well, that's been uh, going for a long time, you know. I mean, the Russians have been working on breaking down and demoralizing the United States for the last 60 years, 70 years. Um, and I think they're still doing it. <laughs> yeah. Do you think it will be something that will become just um, more more intense or more obvious in, in a sense, like it, uh, that it will gain some sort of strength or power to it? That maybe it didn't have before when these when these astrological things come into play. So, in order to um, understand that question or answer that question, uh, I'm going to I'm going to bring up uh, Russia's chart because it's a it's a unique. Now, we're basing on uh, Russia's chart on the the new Russia, which took place after the fall, and I think it was on um, I think it was Christmas Day. What was it, 1991 or 92? Um, let's look at it, uh, and um, and we'll get some insight into that. It's a fascinating chart, and in many ways, it is the exact opposite of the U.S. chart. Of course, it, it would have to be that way, right? Because the U.S. chart is Cancerian-based, and the Russian chart is Capricornian. So it was December 25th, 1991, and I was at 519 GMT. That's when the flag went up in Moscow. This is the new the new Russia, and the the ascendant for the new Russia is 21 Leo, and then you've got Sun in Capricorn at three, True Node in Capricorn uh, at nine, 13 uh, Uranus, uh, and then uh, in Capricorn, and then Neptune in Capricorn conjunction. Now Aries shows up in their chart uh, in the let's see what are we talking uh, 20. So the eighth house is going to be Pisces at eight degrees. And so Aries is the ninth house for Russia. So they're going to have Chiron going through their ninth house, which is foreign countries. So they're, mm -hmm. they're going to have to move out of what I would call their kind of possum strategy right now. It's almost going to force them to move out of the possum strategy. Because what if they have like five or six diplomats and state-related officials, including Putin's driver, all mysteriously die over the last six months. Yeah. And, yeah. What, and what have they done? They really, to our knowledge, they haven't done anything 
um, at least on the surface, because they have all these Capricornian planets. I mean, Capricorn is very steady. It takes its time. It doesn't rush. So they're, they have not been overly reactive with anything that's been going on. Very cool. But this Chiron transit in their ninth house is going to force them, I think, to kind of move out and deal with some kind of a threat outside of their country. That's my sense. So I think that I think they'll be active on the global front. Yeah. Interesting. And also uh, one thing, and then I'll I'll let some of, some of the rest of you ask things. I I, I saw that you also were trained um, as a psychic and a medium, and I was wondering. I know that with astrology, there's so much information that can get really dense. You know, uh, in terms, you know, because there's so many aspects to be dealing with, and I'm just wondering how much of your intuition and even maybe mediumship or channeling um, do you incorporate in in your your readings of, of, you know, these sorts of global and, you know, country? I'm sure in your one-on-ones, maybe maybe it's more so. I don't I really don't know. But I'm just wondering how much you tap into those aspects of your training while you're doing your astrological. I, I would say maybe... Maybe fifteen percent, um, because you know I've been doing astrology pretty intensely for what are we going on ten years now, and you kind of I kind of get sort of immersed in the grid, and uh, which tends to be fairly fairly accurate. And but there are times every now and then when I'll think of something that may not be right there in the moment with astrology, it, but it'll come to me and then I'll look it up astrologically and there'll be some some kind of validation. So um, it happens. It, it does happen. With clients, it happens fairly frequently. And I'll say something um, to a client that will have some sort of personal meaning to them. And that's when I know I'm kind of on the right track. And it, and it just kind of goes into you know kind of a free associative fi- uh, state. And that's when I know I'm on the right track, and, and we've got a connection at a higher level. Um, so it's kind of you know it's a, it's an inside out game, and just and but mostly using the chart as like a point of departure. Yeah, yeah. I imagine it would come in handy just because you can have you know say two people with the exact same chart but very different lives. So I was just. But you get this with twins. Right. Twins are born um, minutes apart, and you'd be surprised how different they are. And yet they have commonalities, but they're very different. And I, I, I tend to assign that to the fact that there are kind of these multiphasic definitions for signs. And one of them can take on one characteristic, mm-hmm. and another can take on another characteristic. So let's say, for instance, they're both Libras. One of them might be really, really, really into relationship and harmonious and and really bonding and, you know, really trying to blend on a Libra level. And the other might be a complete Libra narcissist because Libra does have that, you know, and so they can they can tend to split that way. And sometimes even over the course of a life, I think twins can kind of change roles and patterns. I think they're very unique and very interesting. I'm, I'm fascinated by twins. Yeah. Nice. So another aspect of that, um, that the ascendant also moves fairly quickly. So like if there could be a five minute difference in the birth, but the ascendant might change signs depending on that, where it is. That's a great point because even if let's say, um, the ascendant is, let's say it's at eight, um, Leo, and then the second twin comes in and it's at say 13 Leo, you're, it's still Leo, but we're talking two different decans of Leo. Because the first decan, which would be like zero to about nine point, what is it, six five degrees, would be really, really all about Leo. Hey, look at me, look at me, look at me. Uh, I'm going to be the golden child. And then the second decan of Leo would be more philosophical, and um, it would be, um, look at me and let me show you something that's bigger than who I am. Because that would be Sagittarius, which is the highest station of fire in the chart. So to your point, you're absolutely right, especially when you get into the change of the decans or the change of, you know, one ascendant to another. It can it can definitely it can it can and even like with like degrees of like even the Sabian symbols. If you move off three degrees on a Sabian symbol, you're dealing with a different Sabian symbol, a different kind of, you know, 
point of contact with the world. So, yeah, a small amount of time can actually make a difference, especially on the Ascendant. I've got a sort of question that ties to what Talitha asked, is that um, one of the things I really like about uh, your stuff is that you're not, you don't shy away from, like, fringe kind of conspiracy uh, stuff. Like, you'll talk about everything from, like, the possibility that Hillary Clinton is a clone to whatever else, you know, that sort of thing. And I'm wondering um, if you've always had that kind of bent to your perception um, or if you sort of grew into that sort of embracing of that kind of conspiracy. Because a lot of astrology, it's just astrology, you know. They don't sort of go into sort of the implications almost in a lot of times. It's just very impersonal almost or... So how, what about that is, uh, when did you sort of wake when up? When did I get that? so weird? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess so. When <laughs> you woke I, I think up. I was born that way, man. I, sure. I, so I was always a strange kid. I was a strange, I, I was kind of a normal kid. I loved sports and everything. I was a huge sports head and I liked a lot of things that kids liked back then. I had Hot Wheels and GI Joes and all those kids, but I definitely had a different bent and I saw the, the world a little bit differently and, felt a little bit differently and I asked different kinds of questions. And um, so I've always kind of had a, a, a different sort of point of view. When I was uh, in the sixth grade, um, I stumbled across um, this book called, um, what was it, uh, Psych Psychic Phenomenon Behind the Iron Curtain. And it was this paperback. Yeah. And, and so I looked, I found it, and I looked, and I go, man, this is really cool. And they had pictures of curly and photography and everything. There was like, you know, energy coming out of fingertips. I'm thinking, nah, there's something going on here. And I, I just had a cursory sort of look at the book. I didn't read it and understand all of it, but it really intrigued me. And then um, when I was uh, in the eighth grade, my, uh, my 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 father and I watched Von Donneken's, um, uh, what is it, uh, uh, Chariots of the Gods. We mm -hmm. saw that. Oh, yeah. And, and I, I was like blown away by it. I was like, this is amazing. Right. So my father and I started to get into this research with it. We started to uncover stuff and. He got the Bible, and he's going through the Bible, he's looking for all these references, and mm -hmm. it was a like kind of a cool thing to bond with your dad with. And then, and so I, I actually did a lecture in my eighth grade class about ancient astronauts, and it was the, the teacher dug it so much he rolled me over to the next class, and yeah. I did it there. And so I've always had kind of a weird bent, and I've been open to things, and I've experienced some some strange stuff in my own life, like so it's not just seeing it out there, but I've had some you know, weird things happen. And so I know that we're not living in a very, um, you know, white bread universe, so to speak. And so when it, when it comes to exploring these things, I'm totally game. And I, I think anything is kind of, you know, up for grabs and put it on the table and see what happens. And sometimes some very interesting things occur. I'm, I'm thinking that Hillary Clinton might have had twins. She might, this, I, I'm not sure about the cloning. I'm not opposed to the cloning idea with Hillary, but I think there, there have been, there's been more than one Hillary for a while. Like when oh, she yeah. was running for president Double. the first time against Obama, um, there were reports of her being in two separate parts of New York at the same time. And um, do, both of them were doing fundraising apparently. So this is not this is nothing new for her. This has been happening for a while, and I and I think that this might be more common than we than we know and understand. Like when George Bush was president, there seemed to be two different George Bushes. There and was there's other world leaders that they've talked about this being. You know, it's not yeah not specific to the U.S. either. Yeah. Yeah, and so you know, and when I was when I was living up in Olympia. I ran into George Green and went to one of his talks when I was around 30. And he was talking about the robotoids and the clones. And that was really my first, like, experience coming from somebody in the all world and talking about that. And my experience around that was during the Gulf War, which I was very tuned into in a very psychic kind of way. The first Gulf War was a major awakening for me. And... Um, George Bush, I remember watching him, and of course we have the thousand points of light and all that stuff, and I'm watching this guy's becoming like super powerful. I'm watching, he's like, he's like massive. This is destiny and everything. I, I could see this energetically. And then all of a sudden, something changed. Uh, what's going on here with this guy? 
And then I watched him come off the gangplank on a plane somewhere, maybe in Jordan or someplace like that. And it was almost like he almost stumbled down the gangplank. I, mean, this is, I said, this is weird. I mean, he's either drugged or this is not the same guy. And so I, when George Green came around, I asked him about it. He said he'd been replaced, that, he'd been, the, that he had been cloned. And what was really fascinating was probably about um, maybe four or five months after that is when he was over in Japan having dinner and he completely collapsed and went face sure. down to his food. And at that point, I realized that the clone had expired. That's what had <laughs> happened to him. That's my sense. That wasn't that wasn't a twin. This this was some kind of malfunction in the latest model. So I think perhaps maybe both of these things exist, but I, but I think the twin thing is pretty big too. On that point, um, I, this is something I don't want to offend anybody, but um, and sorry to have to kind of say port before I even ask the question. But this, you know, people get offended when you criticize Obama or talk about Obama. No, screw that. And I, okay, well. <laughs> Just for our listeners and out, uh, listeners out there who might get offended, um, there was these pictures of Obama that had the scars in the back of his head, and I mean I've seen those pictures. They were like it was like Daily Mail. It seemed like AP photographs, and I mean these are striking scars down the back of his head. And I've always you know wondered what the I mean to me it's indicative of some kind of maybe um, brain um, transplant or you know who knows some sort of MK Ultra style. Uh, tinkering with Obama, and I think given how smooth he always seems to be, except when he does things like the it, 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 you know the if and some of these <laughs> other kind of tweaks, um, or you know I, I don't know what's your opinion on Obama. I guess is what I'm asking in terms of this idea of clones um, and maybe how his astrological the, uh, aspects tie into that idea maybe well know. and the other thing is that I mean do we even really have a, a good time for him because if that birth chart if that birth certificate is a as a digit is a, is a forgery i mean it just seems like i guess people he maybe the clone becomes the chart that was presented on behalf of the clone uh or you know how would i don't know how that works in terms of the theory of his birth chart but um just obama how about that as a prompt <laughs> obama. Yeah. he's such an enigma in many ways um, and those scars are serious, man. I mean, it's not like he's got, like, I've seen them. It's not like he has one sort of little scar here, another. I mean, it's, 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 it's kind of like, you know, a, a series of like, you know, Le Mans track scars around his head. I mean, they're, it's significant. I don't know what they mean. I mean, he could have been modified. I mean, he could have been. Who knows? Implanted with with um, some sort of up. I don't. I don't know. But they're quite visible, and those would be indicative of Aries, by the way, because Aries deals with with the head, and um, we've been de- we've had Uranus and Aries over the last seven years. So a lot of kind of head related issues have come to the surface, including like concussions in the NFL and okay I can't let this go any longer because you've mentioned it twice now so you mentioned horse imagery as it relates to um, the myth of Chiron and then you went into football and head trauma the 1969 uh, Super Bowl was the Colts and the Jets and then the 2014 Super Bowl was the Broncos and the Seahawks so there Mm -hmm. you have sea and horse imagery Mm -hmm. Uh, now, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, who, okay, his, Philip is a name that means lover of horses, as we know from Philip K. Dick, but, yeah. um, and then you have C in the middle name. He died the day of the Super Bowl in 2014, February 2nd. That's right. Um, yeah. So, and then the and he C- was shooting was, horse. Yeah. <laughs> and, okay. <laughs> and, okay. So, but you also mentioned, um, uh, the, the raft f- flotilla as being a sort of iconic moment in, in one of your le- uh, recent chats. Um, so uh, that flotilla, um, okay, so that's very Poseidon or uh, Piscean. Neptune, um, I see Poseidon, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right. So, and then we the Ukrainian flag is a trident. Um, we have Aquaman coming out in the Justice League. With that's the right. trident, the Maserati commercial during the Super Bowl, which was right. 
very enigmatic, but also and the, mil- the, and, and the, uh, the symbol for Air Malaysia, which is yeah. also Trident. And then, and then inside 9-11, uh, the memorial at the at the, at the uh, Freedom Tower, you have those P- Poseidon-like scepters, which were part of the girder structure. That you know, it uh, also reminded me of the Jonathan Swift um, Gulliver's Travels, where he goes to the Island of Horses. Um, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, but and then which is another journey across. And you know, you also talked about the Neptunian energy as a sea change for uh, the Piscean Age into the Aquarian. That's right. And we just had David Rockefeller die in the 29th degree of Pisces, which is the last degree of the zodiac, just before the birth of the astrological new year. Yep. Sure. And then you also mentioned um, your initial psychic phenomenon behind the Iron Curtain, and Philip K. Dick often talked about his psychic experiences as it related to Russia. Um, uh, he thought that there was experiments going on about, um, you know, voice to skull type technology, which you know some people are concerned about. Um, you know, the four G or five G. Um, five G. Uh, yep. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, well, the Russians were on it for a long time, and then that's why apparently um, the, the Americans uh, decided to get into Operation Grill Flame and all the remote viewers and Ingo Swan and all that stuff because they wanted to keep pace with the Russians. Um, just really quickly, getting getting back to Obama though, this chart thing is really interesting. Oh yeah, go please. Because there, I, you, what can you believe about the the birth certificate or the birth? Whatever it is, I mean, it could be, it could be absolutely legit. I mean, on some level, maybe it is, and we don't, and we keep looking for holes in it, and and maybe it's really that's the day, and that's the time. I've looked at it. I've looked at it from different areas, different um, sort of zones in the world. I've relocated the chart. Now we know he's a Leo, and quite frankly, um, he acts like a Leo. I mean, he has a lot of egoic pride and. Um, he doesn't like to be uh, – he, he's had that kind of royal bearing, and he's very glib. He doesn't have the hair of a Leo because we know that Leo's like long hair, although when he was young, he had a kind of a style and afro. But when, when I first did his chart, um, it was based on a chart that this woman, Lois Roden, did. And Lois Roden was sort of the, the great dom of charts, and she did so many. She's not around anymore. She did so many that um, Astro.com bought her kind of chart, chart vault, and uh, they have it now on their website, and they, they continually add to it. So the chart, the writing the system? Chart, go ahead. The writing system is based on her? Is that just... Yeah, it's based on her stuff, but also post, post Lois, so it would be like double A, A, B. She gets to like X, you know, forget it. And so if you're in the A... A, B range, maybe C. It's a good chance that the, the time is either close or, or exact. But the first chart she did for Obama and the f- chart that I used was with um, Scorpio rising and Neptune on the ascendant. And that was like the first post that I did on Obama, which was the third post I did on my website. And to me, that that ascendant actually made a lot of sense. Because when we get into, and this ties into your Neptunian piece, when we get into Neptune, it becomes like a real projection. Like we see into Neptune what we want to see into it at times. It's, it has that kind of sort of fluidity and yet kind of mirror-like quality. Think of like a, you know, a, a, a lake or, or a pond that's very still and you can see your reflection in it. I mean, that's kind of in some ways, a, a, a metaphor for for Neptune. So with ba- Obama, who would have had Neptune in Scorpio on the Ascendant or in the first house, people were able to view him as whatever kind of archetype or myth that they wanted to kind of ascribe to him. And one of the first images that we became kind of aware of with him is this image where he's on the beach. I don't know if you've ever seen the photo, but he's wearing shorts and he's come out of the water and he's glistening, and he's new, and uh, he's like it's just like he's emerged from our collective unconscious. Yeah, yeah. And, and to me, that really was representative of two things. Number one, um, Neptune on the ascendant, uh, this emergent kind of sea god, and then also 
Um, very reminiscent of a photo that JFK did, although not as explicit. When he was president, and he was in a pair of shorts, and he was on the beach, and he was signing autographs. So it, it, for, it was kind of linking him in some ways to JFK. Like, we never saw Bush or any of these people on, in shorts and on the beach. But we saw JFK, <laughs> yeah. and we saw Obama. So that chart actually made some sense to me. This Philip Seymour Hoffman thing was really fascinating, but, you know, almost like this ritual sacrifice before the Super Bowl. Well, that's what like I wondered. Is just got slaughtered, man. Yeah, it's like an invocation of Neptune. Um, yeah, they just got slaughtered. I mean, it was like from the from the first snap, they were just underwater, literally in that game. <laughs> yeah, that kind of made me want. When you said horse and changing into horse, it made me think of Twin Peaks because that's on everybody's mind because it's coming back. <laughs> And there's that really enigmatic scene in the original series where um, Laura Palmer's mom has that vision of a of a big horse in her in her in her living room, and I never understood what that was. And then you just said that Kronos disguised himself as a horse, and that's I said right. that's 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 Saturn, that's Bob, that's that's Kronos uh, disguising himself and revealing himself in that moment. So that's kind of at least that seems what to be what it means to me. Um, when, when is Twin Peaks coming back? In May, May twenty first is when it starts. <laughs> First Gemini, Gemini. Yeah, yeah, and right there. Interesting. David Duality. Lynch. <laughs> David Lynch was born January twentieth, so that makes him. Well, what, okay, that's an interesting birthday. January twentieth. That's inauguration. Inauguration. Day. Inauguration day. Inauguration. Yeah. It's the same birthday as Kellyanne Conway. And it's the same birthday as Nikki Haley, who is the now the U.S. envoy to the U.N. Uh, I'm going to go on paper right now, and I'm going to say that Nikki Haley will be the first female president of the United States. Hmm. I don't know who she is. Yeah, I don't know her either. She was She's an Indian American from South Carolina. From uh, was it South Carolina? It's South Carolina, yeah. She's yeah. an Indian Sikh American. She's a Sikh. She's a Sikh American. I was I found that out about her last night because I was checking. Yeah, she's out a warhawk. She's a total warhawk. I mean, that was one of the first disappointments for me after the, the Trump. And you know, I'm not saying there weren't others before this, but it was a big disappointment when she got up at the UN and started neoconning in terms of just like. Uh, warmongering against Russia and Ukraine and Syria. I mean, it just kind of was business as usual coming out of her mouth. So I'm not really a fan. I was hoping you Tulsi Gabbard. You gave her the light, man. Totally, right? It's like, just go for it. Lay, throw it down. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a fan either. Trust me. I, I mean, we've had enough of these involvements, and I'm not a fan of the neocons, and, and we've had enough of the hawk, hawkish stuff and the military-industrial complex. I'm not a fan, but I'm telling you, she'll she she will be the first female president of the United States. And the reason why, it's interesting, I got to say this real quick, that she turned yeah. 45 on Trump's inauguration as the 45th president. That's right. Mm, good catch. Good catch, absolutely. That's cool. It, and Mike Pence was at APAC two days ago. It man was he singing her praises. Whoa. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. Um, so well, I've got. Um, uh, go ahead, Talitha. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, uh, I, I was just, was just wondering, just in terms of this, sort of like goes back to something you were talking about earlier, but it was triggered when you guys were talking about ho- horses and Trojan horses, and I was uh, the Trojan horse thing sort of got me triggered into thinking you were you were talking about um, clones, and then I was I was thinking about. I'm someone who um, has has always in this lifetime uh, perceived a lot of things. I perceived the world through like frequencies and energies and and um, just observing people like, say, Hillary Clinton, who who uh, at one time had an energy field and then then didn't have an energy field any longer and things like walk ins or clones. And I was wondering how in what way is that something that you perceive in a chart? Are there certain um, uh, planets or aspects that that can come in at certain times that can kind of show you when something that like that may happen? Or, you know, do you look at the astrology in sort of a multi-dimensional way where you could see things like clones in 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 in, a, 
you know, in, in a certain aspect of, of a multidimensional chart? Or, you know, is that something that you look at when you're reading charts or can see when you read the charts of people who you perceive as having clones or walk-ins or whatever? I can, you know, it's a really good question. And I have had experiences where I can tap into maybe themes that might relate to other incarnations that mm -hmm. people can resonate with. That's more frequent than not. The, the, the walk-in thing is fascinating because I had a client today who told me that she was a walk-in at 16. And I looked at her chart to try to understand it. And there was some stuff happening in her chart in kind of a big way. You have to understand a little bit about astrology, but she had Pluto in her eighth house, which is the underworld. Mm -hmm. And so it's in its own house. And it was a conjunct Venus in her chart in Virgo, very tight conjunction, in fact, exact. And at that time, Saturn was opposing Pluto. It's a lot and it was of wings. Pisces in her second house. And it was like, so here we have this kind of death energy with Pluto in the second, and then, I'm sorry, in the eighth, and then in Saturn transiting the second, which is kind of this sense of incarnation and body and Pisces and fluidity. So I didn't see that. She brought it up, and I looked at it, and I said to myself, we could make a case for this. Because there was an intensity of feeling in her life. There were all these people that were dying in her life, and all these people that were dying of drugs, which was very Neptunian. Here we go, Neptune again. And so all she wanted was out. And she said at some point she felt like a different person. So I'll, I made a note of that, okay? Saturn, opposite Pluto, Virgo, Neptune, eighth house, second house. Robert, Robert that's really interesting that you mentioned that about uh, drugs um, because I, I had been thinking about River Phoenix, um, and he died very young at 23, um, a number that came up in a different uh, conversation of yours maybe that was a uh, I don't remember but um anyways and sort of it isn't 23 an important astrological degree or is it 22 22 23 no well tw 22 is generally considered like the number of the master builder right. on the 22nd of each month is usually when the signs change and it's right that's true too. and it's connected actually at that point to the 29th degree of a sign and that's the anoretic degree which is the sign is over at that point there's really not much energy left it's completely dissipated it, it's kind of interesting because a lot of people make um uh, you know there's a lot of buzz about being born in the 20th oh wow 20 cool cool no, but it's the end of the sign so you don't have a lot of energy to 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 promote um, with that kind of numerological vibration. But that number 23, you know, it's, we got the Jim Carrey movie and because, you know, the, you know, the story about Byron Geisen in, in Morocco, do you know that? No, no. Okay. So there was this guy named By Brian Geisen, B R Y O N Geisen. And he was this group, part of a group of expats um, living in, uh, Morocco, including Paul Bowles and William Burroughs, and they're they were you know very decadent and very much into things like opium and heroin and young boys and young girls. It was like a total you know Disneyland for for decadence and sin. And and Geisen was he he invented something called the Dream Machine, which is this kind of um, thing that you make on a on a turntable and it puts you in a trance. So he was very into trance and he was a situationist. And he had a meal in a restaurant in Morocco that he did not like. And he he called the, the, the owner of the restaurant over and insulted him about the meal. And the restaurant owner cursed him. And and he said, You are you you are now under the curse of twenty three. Twenty three will follow you everywhere and it will haunt you from this this point forward. And the number twenty three will kill you. That moment and the subsequent 23 sinks drove uh, Brian Geisen insane. So, oh, yeah. I'm familiar with the dream machine. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of the Jim Carrey stuff from the movie comes from the Brian Geisen story of this 
23 myth out of Morocco. And so that's where, I mean, of course, there's other references to 23, but that that's kind of the, the 23 is a curse number. Oh, interesting. And yeah. speaking of numbers, do you, uh, do you look for patterns in terms of the numbers and the degrees in astrology? You know, when you see certain um, aspects and, and lineups, you know, like, like 69, uh, 1969 and, you know, what's coming in 2018. Do you, do you find numerical patterns anywhere? Even if some of the patterns are say, you know, the opposites or mirror images, or do you ever look at those things? Um, I tend to, I, I tend to, I do, I do. Um, sometimes I find them. I don't necessarily go looking for them. Like when I drilled down into nine eleven, I mean, it was mind expanding. What you, what you would find with throughout history with nine eleven. Um, I tend to look at more along the lines of if there, if, if there are events that happen on certain days that that grabs me and and so the, the i would say that the the numbers themselves which would be associated with the days you know like i just want to go over this thing in 1969 i just want to read you like one month this is when chiron goes into aries in 1969 it starts off very innocuously as janet lynn wins the uh, u.s female figure skating championships but then it heats up quite a bit on February 4th, Yasser Arafat is named the chairman of the PLO. Boom. Right there. Now, this changes roughly the next 20 years in the Middle East. Okay, that's on February 4th. Now, another strange event, although not necessarily as kind of globally groundbreaking or shaking, is that the Beatles on February 4th appointed Eastman and Eastman as general counsel to Apple. Of course, that comes from Linda McCartney's side. So all of a sudden now you see this, this connection with the Beatles and Paul McCartney and Linda Eastman. And then we have uh, something very interesting happening here. We have Golda Meir being voted president of Israel. And this is kind of a big deal. Number one, she was, used to be a terrorist. She was part of the, uh, what was that? What was that gang? That uh, Stern that, gang. Just a yeah, gang. one that bombed the King David Hotel. Yeah. yeah, and so she becomes president of of Israel. So when we get into Chiron and Aries, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with we're dealing with male energy, Aries, but it's different, right? It's like it's wounded, it's afflicted, it's it's not necessarily really male. So we have this female leader who actually becomes quite hawkish as the uh, first female prime minister of Israel, then, then the PLO doesn't waste any time. They attack a, an LL plane in Switzerland on February 18th. This is all just in one month. Uh, the Beatles Port Abbey Road. There's a Mariner 6 flyby of Mars. Here's what's interesting about 1969. You get these Mars flybys. They're launching, right? They're launching these Mars flybys. Did you have the run up to the fake moon landing, all these kind of Apollo things going on in 69? But while we're launching these satellites to Mars, the Russians are launching satellites to Venus. It's very bizarre, right? I mean, these two countries are always doing these sorts of things in tandem and yet sort of separately at the same time. Um, Assad's old man, uh, Hafez al Assad, he takes power. In February 1969. So we have the PLO started. We have Golda Meir as the first f a female prime minister, Hawk, of Israel. And then we have Assad's father coming into power all in one month. That's all in the first month of Chiron and Aries. And, wow. it, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger from that point forward in 1969. The That's Irgun just, is the name of the organization. The Irgun. Irgun thank you. Yeah, she was a member of Irgun. Just one other thing. I mean, 69, I always think of my uh, Altamont Speedway. And, yep. um, you know, that's, I guess, if you're talking about masculine energy, sort of the failure of that, I mean, that, that event kind of is emblematic of it. We've talked about it 
before as being a ritual and there was some discussion of like astrologers being involved in choosing the date uh you know of electing the time with uh, the moon until, yeah yeah the moon debilitated in scorpio mm-hmm. and there's an article in rolling stone about it where th- there's like a quote saying why didn't they have an astrologer everyone knows the moon in scorpio is a, a bad thing and then you know the implication is well they did consult an astrologer and they did choose that time for this kind of ritual killing maybe that's one theory, but um, that's at the end of 69, and I, I guess that people consider that event the death of the hippie age, mm-hmm. and so it might make sense, you know, if Chiron... I, I'm wondering, I guess, the wounds that, that were done on the nation in terms... Of, I'm sure you're familiar with Dave McGowan's work, but... like oh, the absolutely. Hippie, great, great stuff. Yeah, the hippie movement is kind of a of, of, a, of an ob, obscuring... Um, you know, the power of the people, as it were, from from uh, war, anti-war movements and things like that. So wait, so that would be Pisces, Chiron and Pisces, then Chiron into Aries. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it feels like you know, the hippie movement was like a limited hang, right? I mean, yeah. they, they created it for a period of time so they could sort of abduct people's consciousness. And then it was like, okay, you guys have had enough enlightenment. Um, time, time to, time to shut the club down. And that coincides with a huge production of methamphetamine, benzodrine, and speed, which replaces, um, LSD and, and the uh, psychedelics. And so if you, if you look at stories from Haight Ashbury in 1969, 1970, the energy is very, very different. It's dark. It's speedy. It's the, the junkies are starting to move in. Um, and that all has to do, of course, with you know drugs coming from Vietnam and you know, control of the the Golden Triangle, which the CIA and the United States Army were you know very happy to take control of. Let me give you a few more things here that happened in 1969. Um, Gaddafi seizes power in Libya in 1969. So you have you have Yasser Arafat, Gaddafi, and old man Assad all coming to power in Golda Meir all in 69. Chiron and Aries, right? So we're going to be afflicted through through war and violence, and even to some extent, with terrorism, real or or fake. But that's a it's a that's a major time for what was going on then, and of course the the end of or the death of hippie for sure. You know what else happened in '69 that I like is the uh, is the Beatles rooftop concert, which was on the last day of January, mm-hmm. um, uh, which I don't know what that means. That's before. Chiron, or what? What are, what are we talking about here? The what transition? Sorry. Um, so Chiron goes goes went into uh, uh, Aries. Aries in in uh, February. So that would have been Chiron and Pisces if it was at the end of January. Right. So I'm thinking like and that's kind of like the death. Really, exactly. The too, exactly. Right? It's like a send off. It's like saying goodbye to what it, what they were in the '60s in general. I always thought that movie was really depressing. Very much, but I love that concert. Um, anyway, sorry to interrupt. Well, I've got. Uh, I mean, I, at some point we can talk about this eclipse, and I just pulled up a, a by wheel with uh, Trump's chart and this eclipse chart, and there's yeah. some really fascinating phenomenon, and ter- like some partile like uh, conjunctions and just some yeah. wild stuff going on with with, sure. with this chart. So I, maybe, I mean, I want to talk about it at some point. I mean, I don't want to... No, I have it up with... here, and I can, I can do a sinistry chart um, with okay. the two of them, because I have Trump's chart on my my computer. I'll be happy to pull it up. Go ahead and, and uh, bust out what you're seeing. Yeah, so I'm just, I've got, I mean, this, the one thing that's striking me, I mean, obviously the, the degree of the eclipse... Uh, so the sun and the moon are right in the same part of the sky, and that's right next to his ascendant. It's within right. a de- it's within a little over a degree of his ascendant. That's right. But then and and his, and his Mars, which might be you know depending on how you would analyze it, could be his most difficult planet there. Yep. But then you've got um, a Saturn transiting Saturn is conjunct his natal sun uh, moon. It's been there for a while, and yeah. Um, so yes, and that's and but on the eclipse. Now the thing with eclipses, which are interesting, is that you can have run up energy to an eclipse about a week and a half before, and then you can have dissipating energy from an eclipse about a week and a half to two weeks after. 
So you're looking not just at this moment of the of the of the sky, but kind of a a, a, a more elongated or extended space. So, but this is where the peak of it is. And um, it, so he's had Saturn on his moon for a while now. And the question would be, would that become more exacerbated with the eclipse? It's also on his south node, which is his weakest point in his chart. It's also connected to, you know, the women in his life, in his home life. And there's there's a lot been a lot of kind of exposure lately that he and Melania don't sleep together. They don't share the same bed, and you know I I even sort of threw it out there that Melania might not even be a woman, you know. And I'm and I'm not opposed to exploring what that would look like, you know. She has some very striking kind of male characteristics. So does this fall into the camp of them not sleeping in the same bed? But this but the clips on Trump's Mars and on his ascendant is very intense. Now, do you know uh, who has, let me see now if I can figure this out. Yeah. Are you going to say somebody who has a position in his cabinet that has a, that something related to Trump's ascendant? Yes. It's, it's Mike okay. Pence. It's Mike Pence. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Mike Pence has Pluto in Virgo right on Trump's ascendant. Like, if yeah. I was Trump, I would have yeah. fired Mike Pence months ago. <laughs> because with that aspect, that's very intense. That's, 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 like, a, that's like a death aspect. And that's his Pluto, and it's right on... It's, it's, uh, uh, Pence's uh, Virgo, I think, is a, a zero, zero Virgo, so it's like right there in Trump's Senate. And then you've got Jared Kushner, who's... Um, True node is on Trump's Pluto. So here you have sort of Trump and his ascendant and his Mars being straddled by Kushner and Pence. It's, it's interesting that like the dynamic between these two inside of his chart and in the White House. Mars is also in Leo transiting Mars as well um, during the that's eclipse. Right. Mm -hmm. that's uh, right. So that's, I mean, that adds a whole nother Martian energy. I mean, some kind of predictions here. Does this, this to me, I mean, it doesn't bode well, obviously. This, this seems like there could be some, some kind of turmoil. I don't really know what else to say beyond that. Um, but I, I know, like going back to this Robert Zoller prediction where he looked at the eclipse and said, all right, basically, oh, the other thing about this eclipse is the reason why they call it the Great American Eclipse is because it's going to be visible from Portland, Oregon, right. down all the way across the United States, down to like North Carolina. I mean, and that's, that's right. The last time that happened was 1919 or something like that. I mean, it's like a hundred years since we've had an eclipse this visible right in the heart of America. And it's right on the president's ascendant. And right on the president's ascendant. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh, I mean wow. this is a perfect storm, really. So what what are the, what are, what predictions would you have based on? Um, uh, well, I mean, the obvious prediction would be Trump could die during this eclipse. Yes. Okay. I mean, that's I'm the most obvious. The second most obvious would be that we would go to war. Right. Because as president, he would be the one that would issue that charge through Mars on the Ascendant. So I would look at those two possibilities. The other possibility would be that uh, there could be a first strike against the United States because we would be in darkness during that time. Not literal darkness, but figurative or symbolic darkness. And that we... But we would be at our most vulnerable in many ways. Pluto's right there in his chart as well in Leo. Uh, so you've got Pluto, Mars, and the Ascendant in his chart, and then in mm -hmm. the transit transiting chart, Mars, and then obviously the two... Um, and then there's uh, the node the, on Mars as well, the transit And then the nodes. And yeah, then the nodes. So, I mean, it's... Gosh. So there's a lot there. There's, there's, a, there's a heck of a lot going on there. Um, and Uranus is uh, in the third house, and it's going to be, looks like that's Trump's um, descendant, six, seven, that's Trump's ninth house. Uranus is going through Trump's ninth house, and it's squaring off against transiting Venus, which is conjunct his Saturn. Transiting Venus conjuncts his Saturn. And, and his Venus. Venus. But, that, but that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's conflicted energy. And transiting Uranus at that time is going to be what it, uh, let's check out. 
23, 28 Aries. It's 20, 28 Aries. So it's right at the end of Aries. Now, I've noticed when, when we get to the outer planets and we get to like 27 and 28 degrees, the energy goes crazy. Like it, it, it it's it, it's all over the place. It's think of like a a dying star, right? And it's those last moments that it's like expelling, and then it goes to twenty nine, and it just goes, and it's reborn again in zero. Twenty eight degrees Uranus and Aries. That's that's a really um, kind of combustible degree, and it's squaring off it all- against his Saturn. He, there's no patience here. There's no patience for Trump. Before the ninth house is dealing with foreign countries, that, <laughs> that the, yeah, that there's the even foreign... less patience at, at this point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is with foreign countries, absolutely. And so the war idea, I mean, that might be a, we're building a case that it might have to do with with other countries and war. Um, this um, this could be part of building that case that that Uranus placement there in his ninth house, and the and the later degrees, and also. Isn't the later degrees the I guess the Egyptian bounds of uh, the malefic planets uh, have Egyptian bounds uh, in those late degrees, which might be part of the reason why they there's more difficulty. Yeah, that's correct. Yep, that's right. And so and so I mean there's the whole that and, and so the eclipse will be in later degrees. Mm-hmm. Uh, his ascendance in a later degree. The, everything seems to be in these late degrees, like between twenty and thirty. Or at least the, some of the, a lot of the plants we've discussed. That's right. You're, you're absolutely right. And uh, Saturn is going to be at uh, 21 retrograde. So Saturn will be retrograde on his moon. Um, hmm. you know, that's where he's getting into all this, pro- all these problems with, um, you know, with the travel ban and all that stuff. It's that Saturn on his south node and on his moon. He gets these. Activist judge is just blocking him all the way, which is a stupid move. The travel ban is absolutely stupid. But um, he's, he's, yeah, got, that's, he's got it on perfect. his moon, and it's like he's having to deal with restrictions around his emotions, right, and what he would like to see uh, as part of the homeland or his homeland or whatever that represents. And he's got kind of the legal system, Saturn and Sagittarius, sitting on his moon. And so he's had problems with this moon. And it's exact that day. I mean, so for most people, I mean, th- this is transited. Probably this will be the the second time it's coming back down over his moon. Yeah. But it's it'll take what probably a year to go all the way through. But it's only exact probably three days, right? Three or four days. Yeah. So so it moves. It actually moves into um, Capricorn in December. This is the last pass over his moon. Okay. And it, then it moves into his fifth house. So so. Um, he'll. I think with Saturn and Capricorn in his fifth house, he's going to have trouble with his kids, and that could be an issue for him. And it could be anything from his youngest kid to sort of the legal standing of some of his other kids. Maybe they'll ki- kill Baron. <laughs> Man, I tell you, that kid has a trippy chart. Talk about that he a little f- bit. I'd like to hear. So he's he's born. Um, 29 degrees Pisces. So he his birthday was on the day David Rockefeller died. Right. Wow. So he's born in the last degree of the Zodiac. And he's also a Pisces rising, so that makes him a double Pisces. And he's got um, Uranus and Mercury conjunct in Pisces right on his ascendant. I mean, it's very unusual. Hmm. So one could make a case that this could be the chart of somebody who has Asperger's or maybe autism because the, the, the ascendant is how we contact the world every single day. Expression of ego, development of self, and uh, Mercury is the mind, and in Pisces, it's a very fluid mind. It's it's not a mind that is given to like details and you know a lot of structure. It's more of a fluid feeling, imaginative mind, and it's on the ascendant. And, and Uranus radicalizes that mind. It it turns it into something quite different. It's not your normal kind of expression of mind. And so he's got this first and foremost right on. I think the kid is like highly psychic. Hmm. I think he's really psychic. And he's got a trine to uh, Jupiter in his chart with Uranus and Mercury. And Jupiter Uranus trines are like aspects of genius in astrology. He's a very different kind of kid. I don't know what his story is, if he has Asperger's or, but he's different. And I also see in his chart that he's not going to live in the United States. At some point, he will leave the United States. He will live likely with his mother or what, you know, 
uh, Melania outside the United States because he's got his moon in the ninth house. He will move. He won't. He won't Slovenia. Grow. He Maybe. definitely has a lot of alien type, not this planetary kind of energy to me, and really un ungrounded. I don't mean that in a negative way, but in a just in a energetic way, just not connected to this planet. Not no, not he has he has no Earth in his chart. Oh, that makes sense because I look at him and I'm like, this kid does not energetically have connections into this planet. He might as well just be a kite, you know. <laughs> Very much so. Now, okay, I'll throw this out there. If you have time, or even now, if you feel like it, go online and look at images of Baron Trump when he's really young. He he looks like he's a girl. He's very, very effeminate. Now, I'm not saying he's a girl, but there's he looks very effeminate. And now he looks a little more sort of boyish. But when he's young, he's very refined and very effeminate. And, you know, it's a, he's, he's to me, he's very enigmatic. And at that 29th degree of Pisces, you know, it's like that's the end. That's the end of the road. I mean, you know, it's about it's about his you know, kind of old solely in some ways as you can get 29 Pisces. Hmm. Interesting young man. <laughs> and, um, My well, son's at 29 Pisces. You're 29 Pisces. So it's a, it's a really interesting Her degree. I mean, everything, like, you know, you're the ocean of the Zodiac. Everything just flows into you. Her son. <laughs> and then that, I mean, that's Pisces anyway. Yeah. It, has all, it has all 11 other signs in it. That's why it's a difficult sign. So, it, Talitha, is your son born the same day as Baron Trump then? And the, uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh Sorry, it's, it's your son who's born on... on... No, 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 S-U-N. She's, she's S-J's right, okay. joking. Oh, oh, sorry, I no, totally I wasn't joking. Sorry. Oh. I, was I was confused yeah, you there. Okay. So serious. I was like, well, you have a son? son? Good deadpan delivery, yeah. <laughs> So, so it's well, you. It's, it's your son, not your son. My, 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 yeah, I don't have any children. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Excuse me. I apologize. Sorry. So we're but opposite. Like I, I, I'm, 20, I'm 29 Virgo, world. so we're opposite. Wow. That's exact opposite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've heard a lot about um, the so called Pluto in Sag generation of children. That Pluto moved into Sagittarius at some point. Pluto, of course, has this long orbit, and so it transits signs for a long time. And and I've heard a lot of people talking about Pluto and Sag kids as being like tend, tending towards like psychic, uh, that kind of thing. What's your take on is that is that barren or is that a general thing that you see? Well, I think um, I, I think the Pluto and Scorpio kids are pretty psychic. I think the millennials are very psychic, and they have a lot of sensitivity, um, and they also have that kind of really difficult conjunction with Neptune and um, Uranus and Capricorn and issues with father and corporations and the world in general. It's a, it's a kind of a challenging time to be born. Um, the Pluto and Sag kids tend to be very, very wise. You know, they're kind of, there's this, there's this girl on YouTube. She shows up on these flat earth videos. She looks like she's about 16 or 17. I think she lives in Tucson and she's really out there. I mean, you know, she's way out there and I really like her. And she's kind of indicative of the, of some of the Pluto and Sag kids. And they, I think they're going to be a bit more on the conservative side than the millennials are. And I can kind of see that my son is 13 years old, so he's a part of that generation. And I and I watch him, and I and I watch his buddies. They're they're very conservative. A lot of them, you know, they they wear the same clothes. Like I think a lot of kids do that, but they're it's pretty conservative clothing. Um, so it's going to be a sea change from the millennials to the Pluto and, and Sag kids. What does what does Paul Joseph Watson call them? He calls them uh, Generation what Z or what what does he call them? Generation Zero. He calls them Generation Zero. Anyway, uh, those are the Pluto and Sag kids, and they're, I think they're fascinating, and they're going to be extremely philosophical, and, and they're not going to – they're going to make up their own minds. You know, They're not going to necessarily want people to sort of tell them what to do or 
um, but their their philosophical approach and their relationship to cosmos is going to be interesting. I think they're going to be deep. I think they're going to be very deep, and they're they're broken down into two groups. Like the first wave around ninety six to about two thousand ninety nine two thousand, um, they have uh, Uranus and Aries. I'm sorry, Uranus and Aquarius and Neptune and Aquarius. So they have this Uranus Neptune conjunction. So they're out there. They're really out. That that kind of first wave of Pluto and Sag kids are really out there. And then they flip. My son has Uranus in uh, Pisces and uh, Neptune uh, in Aquarius. Uh, so it's a it's a it's a it's, it's different. It's, it's it's so there's like two different kinds of waves inside there, but they're going to be very deep and very profound in their own way. And I tend to think more conservative. I'll give you an interesting kid I just discovered today who's part of that generation. You're going to see some great athletes out of this generation. <laughs> and there's a kid who's a 17 year old soccer player who just started playing with the national team, and he dominated last night against Panama. He was so good that the Panamanians had to beat him up. He's only 17. We're going to start to see more of these kids with Pluto and Sag. There'll be some phenomenal athletes. The Pluto and Capricorn kids, they're going to be fascinating. They come on the scene around 2010. And these are all really old souls. I mean, these kids kind of, they're ready to run the planet. You know, they're going to be ready to run the planet by about 15. And some of them will be insufferable because they'll be so smart and so together. But they're gonna uh, they're gonna be very interesting, and um, I you know that I think we're gonna be okay with with the Pluto and Capricorn kids and that generation, even Pluto and Sag. It's, we're gonna see a swing back, I think, to less of the kind of you know social Marxist ideologies and more in terms of people thinking for themselves versus these institutions kind of you know yeah. guiding them along in in a trance in some ways. That's my take. Yeah, I. I feel you. On the, like I feel like these kids that are that have been coming in recently, they have a like a real strong sense of like self responsibility, you know, and that like then seems to spread out into every other aspect of the globe, rather than yeah. you know little robots. Oh, I see these Pluto and Capricorn kids, and some of them amaze me. They're like little little adults, man. They're like really. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> you got all this going on right now. Wow, it's gonna be interesting. One thing I wonder yeah. about re- hearing, you know, about these, you know, the progression and the kids, is that I was thinking about asking when it was that Pl- Pluto moved to Sagittarius exactly, because for some reason I thought it was like '89 or late na- late '80s. I might be wrong. No, it was nineteen. There was nineteen ninety six. Okay. Well, my point anyway was that. Um, in '89 was when they up they first really upped the vaccine schedule for kids, mm-hmm. and um, obviously they've continued to up it. And I'm wondering if like part of that has to do with like staving off this new generation of of kids that w- would be, you know, that are have all this incredible potential. I mean, this is kind of obvious when you think when I start to say it, but all these kids with this incredible potential are being, you know injected and pumped full of these chemicals and stuff uh increasingly and and so as we move you know into capricorn a lot of these kids are going to be damaged and aren't going to be um okay you know so i wonder if that's part of the whole social engineering process it's got to be and it's tragic i mean the the statistics around vaccine injuries for boys is kind of just accelerating at a at a really mind-boggling rates mm-hmm. yeah. what are they what are they scheduled out but 20 years from now like one out of four one and two one out of every two children is seen one out will, of will two. Be, oh. maybe boys will be autistic by like 2040 or something like that yeah they, so i think it was like 20, 20 years from now the the the, the, the rate is just mind-blowing yeah you know? And they're just upping the number of vaccines all the time. I think mm-hmm. in the last 33 generations, I'm sorry, it's gone from like 2 to 60-something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In three generations. That's mind-bending. It's incredible. Yep. And, and it's, 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 it's I, I can kind of attest to it as a parent. I did not have my son vaccinated for a very long time. Hmm. And and I'm divorced from his mom, and his mom all of a sudden decided, well, let's get him vaccinated. Oh, no. And this happened uh, last year. And I am 
and can, he's got all kinds of problems with his stomach now. Hmm. Yep. And he's he's got gas all the time. Mm-hmm. His stomach hurts. He vomits, and it's like you know, I know, I know what causes that. Mm-hmm. That's exactly. There's a really that's big ex- chance that those vaccines screwed up his GI tract. Exactly. That's exactly what Andy Wakefield's study originally said. I mean, people like to say Andy Wakefield was just like. Vaccines cause autism. Well, no, his paper was about how vaccines have the potential to mess up the the digestion, and I don't know, I'm not scientific enough to repeat it all, but that's exactly what he was he was saying, and he was completely uh, vilified for it. Um, but yeah, that's. But so he was when? What? How old was he when he got his first uh, vaccine? This was just last year. He's 12 years old. So okay. I mean, we. <laughs> I really thought we were on the same page and this just wasn't going to happen. Mm-hmm. And then, I, and then I got the, the, the sort of the, the bombshell, like, Oh, it's going to happen. Yeah. And, and, and since I am not a custodial parent, I had no say in it. And I know my ex-wife, his mom, and when she makes up his mind, her mind, she's an Aries, it's going to happen. <laughs> and I could send her 20 articles and I could send, I could buy her a copy of Vax to watch and it probably still happen. Yeah. So at that point, I had to kind of let go and surrender and just kind of pray that he was going to be, you know, okay. And for the most part, I think he's okay, except for, and, and, and I told her, I said, look, if it's going to happen, if you're going to do this, do not get the MMR in one shot space. And, exactly. you know, thank God she did that. And also you know, she, that, she he, did that. But, that he grew. But he still has issues digest with digestion now, and it's unfortunate. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, the it's good that, because when obviously when they're baby, that's when they're most vulnerable. So now that he's Absolutely. he's grown, he's he developed kind of a the blood brain barrier in his head develops more, and he has more protection from it. And it and and you can um, chelate and uh, repair that kind of damage. Um, but anyway, yeah, so, unfortunately, it's not going to be on my watch. Right. Just, uh, <laughs> right. I don't. I don't have that kind of but pull. In, but in terms of the, you know, someone who's delved deeply into not just Lyme, but all sorts of co-infections and viral overloads. You know, when someone gets an injection of a virus, no matter when it's from, uh, and you start having multiple viruses, and some of them, like the MMR, where they're they're multiples together, um, you know, we're really looking at, uh, you know, viruses, no matter what, even if you chelate, out, you know, any of the l- aluminums or other things, you're still looking at viruses that go dormant and that that if the child hasn't already had it, especially if the thymus is, is you know, completed its, its ability to learn how to fight off certain things, you have these viruses that are going dormant and all it takes is, you know, a point later in life for any person to have, um, you know, a weakened immune system over stress, over whatever, and these viruses then start to to wake and and when you have multiple ones the viral overload and the way they interact with one another and the way they actually team up together in the body is something that as of as of yet i haven't seen anything in terms of like chelation or or herbs or even diet that can change that hmm. you That's can like you know use some herbs to stave it off but they're so intelligent and they work together and there's not a lot of research about what what to do for that. Have you have you have you gotten into more gallons? Have you dove into more a, gallons? A, a little bit, only only in the in terms of of being in the Lyme community, and that being another one of the you know if you believe in Lyme, um, which which I don't as just a singular. Um, uh, uh, type of thing, but, but really these co-infections, which are many, you know, different bacteria and many different viruses. And, and, you know, they're giving names to different things like limes and morgellons and that sort of thing. But really what I have found in my research, I was someone who was really sick for a long time and, and was researching like crazy and was part, had some stem cell stuff done. And I spent, you know, years in the community um, doing my own research with people and, and just finding that so many of these things that have labels and, and things like that are, are, again, it's people that have multiple bacterias and multiple viruses along with some parasites. And how those different, you know, things are working together 
and each person's system is triggering all of these different neurological and nerve responses that, again, are showing up differently. And you can give them names, but at the root, it seems to me that so much of it is that it's like it's like a computer with multiple viruses and bacterias and mm-hmm. all these things running in the background and and it all shows up in these different ways that we can label but again at the root i don't think it's any one what any one of these things and then you add on to it not just the the frequencies literally the energy um consciousness of these viruses and bacteria, but then you add on to it things like other frequencies being triggered you know in people's brains and then and uh um things like that, then you just have systems that are breaking down and sending wrong messages all over the place, which is then causing the nerves to send messages in all sorts of ways that aren't, aren't, are, you know, misfiring and, and, and mis, mismanaging themselves just, and these, you know, smaller sectors as well as like the whole system. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, again, Morgellons is something that comes up a lot with Lyme patients. Um, and and so, you know, I, I haven't res- researched that one alone by itself entirely, but, but seeing it as one of these things that seems to be related to these, like, you know, multiple overloads right. of things. Yeah, yeah, that there is more of like an array of kinds of um, pathogens and, and viruses and all these things that kind of somehow coalesce together, right? And they, and they form this very complex sort of system and network, which is can look at like one thing to maybe one researcher, another thing to another researcher. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, in a sense. And, and you know, so, you know, some of the bacteria we need, right? They're, they're good. But these viruses seem to be working together with one another and with certain bacteria with their own consciousness system within the body and depending on certain people's, and this is where I think vaccines um, and antibiotics now are really like, uh, you know, adding into it is that they can look at certain genetic dispositions or predisposed genetics. And there are certain viruses that will trigger one aspect of like what they might consider an autoimmune disorder that, never would have come up if it hadn't been triggered by this particular thing. And now there are antibiotics that certain antibiotics now are triggering autoimmune disorders. And those antibiotics are being prescribed more than others. Mm -hmm. So you're, you know, injecting people with viruses and who knows what else. Then you're, you're, you know, giving them certain antibiotics being prescribed more that cross over and trigger certain autoimmune things. And you're just literally basically reprogramming the entire system, whether it's neurologically or at the immune system. Um, anyway, I could go on forever. Let's talk more about <laughs> I, was, hey, I, want, I wanted to bring in an, a, a, a date from 1969 that is pertinent to this discussion. So okay. May 15th, 1969, this is Chiron and Aries, and we're dealing with blood. Aries is blood. Okay, so there was a teenager known as Robert R., and he died in St. Louis, Missouri, of a baffling medical condition. In 1984, it will be identified as the first confirmed case of HIV-AIDS in North America. Now, I don't know, you know, where you are in the HIV-AIDS spectrum and Lyme and everything else that's associated with it, but I think it's a really interesting kind of moment in time here in 1969, right? We're dealing with Chiron and blood, a blood, bloodborne disease and, and this whole HIV AIDS thing, which again, kind of surfaces in 1984. There it is in 1969. Bioweapon. Yep. I was even even thinking, or I'm even thinking that um, probiotics are, also something that are being is like kind of Trojan horse because this is my has been my experience with mm-hmm. my Erica my girlfriend who I've talked to Talitha about her struggles very similar to yours and she last year took some probiotics and because uh, everybody's saying oh you got to take probiotics to feel better because it's like the whole it's like it's just a blanket thing you got to take probiotics they're good 
But yeah. she, she took yeah. them, and she just almost immediately developed horrible gastrointestinal issues and is now struggling with uh, what, what's called SIBO, a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, where mm -hmm. she has way too much bacteria in her small intestine where it shouldn't be. And so she's had so much trouble with that. So even like the pro probiotics are, there's like a, there's a, there's a war mm -hmm. on our gastrointestinal tract, which is the second brain, as they say. And uh, it's, it's intense and scary. Yep. I agree. Yeah. Well, I just don't, I just don't take there's anything. There's not enough research done on probiotics. So. Exactly. exactly. What are, what are, I mean, what are bacteria? Just like these are millions, billions of little the organisms. Army of consciousness. Exactly. It's tiny. Knows? Exactly. Who knows what's going on in there? Anyway. Yeah. To me, like in terms of working on someone's like energy field or whatever, you know, uh, bacteria in the gut, you know, look can look the same as like an entity you know in the energy field it's just hmm. it's just a a tiny mat a mass of tiny you know um mini consciousness levels together collectively can look at as powerful or can be as powerful as as like you know what appears to be like another being or entity in, in the field that's that's freaky matter the size bacteria the borg mind <laughs> one thing I think this relates to that I wanted to bring in here, Robert, because you mentioned this on one of your recent shows. I really like this phrase, but it's the dark side of the age of Aquarius. And um, different people have been timing our entry into that age. There's all different kind of timing techniques, but we definitely have the great conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter in 2020. And yeah. that'll begin a continuous conjunction every 20 years in air signs. Yep. Yeah. But um, the I mean, I loved how you said the dark side of the age of Aquarius because, you know, it could be Aquarius and air signs might be associated with technology and advancements in technology, but this dark side could include things like this geoengineering that we're seeing and this, like, cellular exploration where there could be um, consequences and wreckage of this kind of technological innovation. And I think we're not really... I haven't heard many people discussing this idea of a dark side of the techno age in this particular context of like the new age, age of Aquarius theme. So I was really happy to hear you mention that. And, um, you know, I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, this, uh, and see where it, see, I mean, it's kind of exactly what you're talking about with uh, bio weapons that have been engineered. I guess there was a seven planets conjunct in Aquarius in 1962. Some people date it to that time. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's but, the, that's know, the, that's known as the, uh, the Antichrist date, right? With all the six planets in Aquarius, 62? Yeah, I think it was seven, wasn't it? Even the moon was in it. There's all the, yeah, seven, the seven, seven visible. Seven, seven planets in Aquarius, 1960. Yeah, it's the Antichrist. Right, February. Supposedly yeah. Antichrist's birthday. Uh-huh. February yeah. 1962? Yeah. Yeah, February I like think, uh, 5th, the close, I think. The closest we get to that, um, celebrity-wise, is Axel Rose. He's born the day after today. Wow. It's David Foster That's Wallace. That's fascinating. Was and then we had a the same con seven planets were conjunct in Taurus in I think ninety two at two thousand, right before nine eleven. Yeah. Um, and so that energy may have shifted back to the Earth to Earth, and that's when the Saturn Jupiter conjunction was in Capricorn in night in uh, two thousand. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyhow, Sat this dark yeah, Saturn Jupiter conjunction was around in sixty one. Uh, okay. Yeah. So you're right. So it's it's the every every twenty years thing. Um, yeah. I mean, we're we're staring down of a I think a potentially very dark cycle or the dark Aquarian age, the shadow of the Aquarian age, and just invert everything that the Aquarian age is theoretically supposed to be about. I mean, that's kind of what it would look like. Um, to a large degree, I mean, it could it could go in many different directions. You know, I think of, you know, sort of, you know, if humans can't work, if we're being displaced by AI, and it's that's coming, by the way, when we get yeah. into Uranus and Taurus, it's going to happen, and 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 it will be probably the next financial boom. Will be AI robotics. It'll be the last hurrah, and then after that. You know, I think <laughs> we're kind of at the end of the road. Um, and so what's going to happen to humans? You know, what are we going to do? 
And I think it, get, it gets about as close as it gets in the Matrix and that we're batteries. We become batteries, living batteries. That'll be, I think, in, in the darkest kind of version of the Aquarian Age, that's what we become. Yeah. Because there's no yeah, other use that for us, really, in, in, that, in that timeline or in that, that kind of iteration of it. I've always thought that was a perfect metaphor, uh, Robert. I'm glad you mentioned that because we're so dependent on technology. And I just saw the Elon Musk um, new company. is His company is about how to embed technology into the brain. And, and, you know, and so, and with VR and things, I mean, you have this vision of someone never having to get out of bed. You know, you have Amazon deliver everything and you just have your VR on and it just, it's like this idea of being horizontal and it's just strikingly similar to the Matrix when they're horizontal in those pods. That's right. Those new v- VR and commercials aimed at young girls. Have you, that's, I mean, it's young girls in the 